Hey guys, welcome to the London Lift podcast. Today we are discussing six common rehab mistakes that might be ruining your return to sport or training. It's something we see time and again, and there are definitely some flaws in the standard rehab system, which we fall and foul of ourselves. And we see a lot of clients or people at the gym, unfortunately, fall victim to as well. So stay tuned for six of the common pitfalls and how to avoid them. But before you get into it, don't forget to click the link in the description box below to get your 14-day free trial to Rob's Strength Formula program, which is your answer to the strength and muscle building equation. And as always, a quick thank you to our show sponsors, thetrainingstimulus.com. Please check out the website if you are a functional fitness coach or practitioner uh, looking to get the next level understanding of movement mechanics there is a free guide to the three vital principles of movement mechanics, which you can download from the website. Also, a big thank you to zagsupplements.com, our favorite daily supplement. Zag is a liquid gel shot delivering 29 vitamins, nootropics, and adaptogens that have significantly improved our concentration, getting us dialed in for work, training, and most notably keeping our energy levels high for the whole day. If you'd like to try it, the founder, Adam, has very generously offered an offer that you won't find anywhere else. If there are still any of these left, uh, by the time you're listening, you can get 50% off a two-week trial pack um, because he's so sure you'll feel the benefits. Just act fast and use the discount code DISCLIFT50, D-I-S-C-L-I-F-T-5-0 on the website. And if you're too slow for that one, we have a backup code for you, which is DISCLIFT20. Uh, which will get you 20% off a two-week trial pack. We hope you enjoy it. Mm. Right, let's get into it. Rehab time. Yeah. I mean, this is, I guess, what does rehab mean to you? Rehab, rehabilitation, coming from a state of injury back to a normal state of training or sport is how I think of it. So that means things like bird dogs, dead bugs, and uh, (laughs) band addicts on rotations, right? Uh, no, I think it means anything that gets you from broken to fixed. But I think we've talked about this in the past. I have a bit of an issue with the term rehab overall mm. in that a lot of people maintain a rehab mindset for too long in that they, they're they reinforcing the idea that they're broken and that they're not training properly when actually whatever stage of injury you're at, it's more productive and better from a mindset perspective to think that you're always training because at the end of the day, we are conditioning our body to be better and to move towards our goals. So even if you're freshly injured, you can still be moving towards your goals from where you are right now. There are still Mm -hmm. productive things you can be doing. And I think framing that as training rather than rehab is a productive mindset, but that's just, you know, one point of view on it. And I think the majority of people in the health and fitness industry still think of rehab stuff as rehab so we'll use that terminology for today to help it translate yeah now i think i i love your obviously the the idea that rehab is just training just obviously normally at a reduced position to where you normally are so like for instance normally you might be deadlifting 100 kilos you might only be deadlifting a kettlebell that's 20 kilos but you're still and that could be your rehab is just getting that movement pattern back and what we're trying to do with rehab slash training is finding where you're currently at where we could push your body to its limit without going over and then that means we can constantly be kind of eking a little bit more a little bit more and you'll find you'll get back to training a lot quicker because you've got you've told your body that it's not a like a crippled little mess anymore it's actually in a it's not as bad as you think like for me i went out for a cycle the other week and being in the saddle for quite a bit of time so it was, i think it was just just over two hours or something like that my left si joint flared up now that wasn't because of the cycle just on its own but that was that i did some heavy deadlifts and i've done a few other bits and bobs that kind of like had aggravated it so like the cycle was just like the icing on the cake and all that then meant was for the week after i just didn't deadlift heavy but i did not train i trained everything i still trained my hinge pattern i still trained everything that i could that didn't cause me discomfort, but I was telling myself like, yeah, you're fine still. And then when I introduced the deadlifts back and I brought them back heavy, they were fine. And mm. it's, it was, for me, if I treated myself as this injured individual, 
I could have then regressed it fully and not done anything. And like I remember when we had Dr. John Houghton on, and like and when we were talking about when you do have a like a severe injury, like in one of your legs, say for instance, by training the other side and try is is going to help promote recovery. And mm. so training through things to to some degree will help you get better. And I think it's a really common mistake to completely rest, like sit around for bed rest, um, to you know pump themselves full of drugs to kind of help with pain and then to try and train through that pain with those drugs and like i think it's important some of the some of the points that we're coming up today i over the past years that i've been doing training well personal training for people like you see these come up in not just them but even our own training and ourselves like what mm. about yourself yeah i think you touched on something that i really think is important for the listeners to pay attention to in that whether you're injured or you're training we're always just trying to get from a to b so we're trying to get from current state towards our goal and take a step in that direction and whether it's doing a rehab exercise or whether it's doing a super heavy deadlift this is one of the reasons i called the company the training stimulus is that all we're trying to do is input a stimulus in our body that will move us towards our goal and classifying some movements as just rehab movements and some as, in air quotes, proper training exercises can be quite counterproductive in terms of how seriously you take the exercises yeah. and how important you think they are because you think, I'm only moving towards my goal if I'm doing that super heavy deadlift. Whereas in reality, you can be moving towards that goal with a broad spectrum of exercises and in fact, the the movements some people think of as rehab movements could get you to your goal faster than the heavy deadlift. And that's true in a lot of circumstances, even in uninjured people moving better can unlock performance faster than doing that super heavy lift because it'll unlock points of performance that you might have not been able to tap into. So I think for the listeners, the first thing to take note of is look at exercises with a little bit more of an open mind to think maybe even though this exercise doesn't feel as heavy or look as cool, it could actually be the one that moves me to the next level of performance, irrespective of whether I'm injured. And um, the other thing you said there was, well, getting a clear state of your starting point leads us nicely into our first point that we wanted to bring up is quite often when we're injured, we think the problem lies in that injured area. So if you've got knee pain, there's something wrong with my knee. If you've got shoulder pain, you think there's something wrong with your shoulder. And the first port of call is often to do something for that part of the body. But for me, we haven't necessarily got a clear picture of what our start point is. So if we're trying to go from A to B, we need to know where A is. And one of my biggest bugbears with the rehab process overall is that we're too focused on treating symptoms and not causes. So if the knee's hurting or the shoulder's hurting, quite often there's not enough investigation as to why those body parts are hurting. And with a lack of a proper assessment or even a consultation, this is a pattern we see time and time again in that you do tons of knee rehab exercises, you do tons of shoulder rehab exercises, and you might get temporary relief, it might go away short term, but that issue reoccurs because the cause of the issue is actually elsewhere. It might be in the foot if it's a knee, it might be in the spine if it's the shoulder. There's lots of different ways it could have come about, but this is part of the reason why I'm working in this space myself is that I had a shoulder injury and I did tons and tons of shoulder rehab, but actually it wasn't so much about the shoulder as it was about my spine. And um, I think point number one, is get a proper assessment, get a proper consultation. I think in this time pressured world, when you go and see a specialist, they quite often want to get you in and out as quickly as possible. And they won't even ask basic questions about how the injury occurred. Like what was the mechanism? Did it occur over time? Was there an impact or a collision or something like that? And unless you understand how the injury came about, it's very difficult to accurately address the issue because you don't know you don't know what caused it how can you deal with the cause of the issue you're just trying to um figure it out in in hindsight without actually the full set of information so if you're talking to your trainer or you're talking to your healthcare professional 
try to make sure they have as much information as possible. And that can be not just around the injury and how it happened, but your history leading into it. I'll always ask my clients about their training block leading into an issue. Was there a spike in volume? Did they change movements? Were they stressed in other areas of life? Did they change their job? Did they do like a manual job? That can have a huge impact as well. All of these factors give us clues as to what the causative mechanism of the injury might have been. And then we can have a much surer uh, approach in thinking we're addressing what actually caused it rather than just guessing, oh, the knee hurts. So let's just do some knee stuff and hope that sorts it out. Yeah, I mean, when I when I know I've had uh, clients in the past and they've, maybe they've said to me, oh, I've got a bit of a dodgy back, like my hip's a bit flared up. And they've been like, oh, cool, what, what have you been doing in the meantime? And like, oh, I was doing a load of stretching and stuff like that to kind of alleviate. And I'm just like, so you've got this inflamed area and you're going to be <laughs> then str- holding these long stretches to... To, to what give you relief and they're like yeah and it's like and then when i explain it to them and i start and i break it down a little bit they're like oh yeah fuck that's not actually a good thing to do i was <laughs> like no not really like again it's very relative but for me when it does come to the symptoms um not the causes it's it's the easy quick fix to say okay the shoulder's fucked right let's focus on the shoulder and give you that temporary relief because that is what's going to make the person feel like they're better and if they feel like they're better, then that person they've gone to go and see is right. Mm. I've done my job. They're that they've done everything that they've needed to do. They've made them feel better, and they've left having a bit of a plan going forward. I think this is then where understanding or having a deeper understanding of movement mechanics as a whole, and maybe understand who you're talking to. So if you're talking to just a GP that's trying to give you something to kind of help you out, then fine. But if you actually are someone that, say, if you're someone that trains and you like to push your body, you're going to need to think a little bit more into that specialist field. And if you're talking to your physio and your physio is saying to you, okay, maybe just do like these, let's say like banded external rotations or like some whatever, like just using that as an example if you can see how that's going to carry over to what you normally do in your training fair enough crack on but if you mm-hmm. don't see the carryover and you don't say okay how is this actually going to help me get better then it might be worth finding a movement mechanic specialist to take a deeper look and as ash said there find the reason to why you got injured in the first place because then we have a much lower chance of it actually happening again yeah, exactly. And then, yeah, you touched on something there, which leads us nicely into the second point, which is basically the big mistake. Number two is not bridging the gap sufficiently. So either going too safe in your rehab or returning to sport too soon. And this is the other classic in the standard rehab protocols. If anyone's ever been given a printout or a PDF, a standard one to deal with a standard issue, um, irrespective of how their injury happened or what sport they're returning to, you've got a good guess and it's not going to be very well suited to your particular situation. And as we've discussed many times on the podcast, the body adapts through a process of progressive overload. It likes predictability, it likes consistency, and it likes being nudged forwards in small, progressive, uh, almost predictable steps. So the body knows how it needs to adapt in what direction. And the same is true in rehab. And the classic mistake that I'm talking around in the roundabout way is that people do these printed out rehab exercises for a little while and they think that they're then magically sorted and they're ready to go back into 100% full contact, full heavy weights in the gym. And then lo and behold, the injury reoccurs because they've left a huge gulf between what they've been doing with their body and what they're now suddenly asking it to do again. And the easiest way to think about this is we need to create stepping stones, taking us from A to B, which are small, consistent and progressive, rather than just jumping from, yeah, some basic low level, low load, low speed um, floor lying exercises to then jumping under a heavy barbell at heavy speed or sprinting, changing direction and running into contact, playing rugby. There's obviously a huge difference between one and the other. 
and the bigger the step is from one to the other the more likely the body's going to react negatively because of the system shock the lack of preparation of the tissues um, everything is just not a nice time for the human body as compared to filling in those gaps nice and progressively and i think there's a lot of dimensions by which we can measure that gap the easiest one would be just weight on the bar like if you're a weightlifter then obviously building up the weight slowly and progressively going from something that is pain-free and mechanics are good towards your old one but other variables which i don't think get considered as much are speed or ground reaction forces um, we did a great episode with matt mckinnis watson talking about plyometrics and how that reactive um reacting to the floor at speed and with force is actually a huge part of a lot of sports especially running and that's something that thankfully now is getting more time and attention but i think historically hasn't had enough time and attention in the rehab journey in that we go from slow static strength which we'll talk about more next um, and go into high speed high impact training without necessarily preparing our body in a progressive way and that sudden change even if we've done some really good work in our rehab journey the sudden change is still too much too soon through those lenses so when you are working with your coach or your healthcare professional just make sure you've got a nice plan where no step feels very sudden doesn't feel very big to go from what you're doing this week to what you're doing next week because if it feels sudden to you in your mind it definitely feels sudden in your body and in your tissues i mean this is why i say i i would generally have a certain referral of physios that i uh, recommend too because for me i think when it comes to dealing with a physio or movement specialist i think it's important that they understand those stepping stones and the journey from a to b because it's if they're just trying to get you back to homeostasis and you're someone that trains, that's not going to be enough because that's exactly the point you said there where you, you go from lying on the ground to then running on a pitch at someone, say with rugby or something like that, or back under a barber. You're like, where was the step from the ground up? Like, <laughs> There's a lot to deal with in that, in that gap. And mm. I think if you're dealing with the right kind of professional who understands the journey that it's going to be to get to where you was and where you want to get to i think it's going to be a much more of a collaborative process where you can both deal with the journey together and then you can have feedback towards each other and say right this feel, felt good or this is a bit too much and they're going to understand that journey whereas mm -hmm. if it's someone that has no idea and this is a problem with like people that have like health insurance and they they've got like um like Aviva or something like that with just some basic general physios are just trying to get people back to standing and not in some sort of pain but they're people that train and you're like they're not good they're, they don't have not that they're not they're, they're great at their job at getting people probably back to zero but you're not at zero you're at 10 so you, yeah. go, you gotta think All right, I've gotta be back here and that that gap the zero to 10 is exactly those stepping stones that Ashley's talking about there that really need to be paid attention and they don't have to be really small steps and this is the thing people yeah. don't people like if your body's responding really well to certain things it might just be a mental barrier that you're kind of getting over at this point that we're trying to get through and the body's actually saying yeah i feel pretty good here and you're giving your body enough time to essentially analyze what's just happened and recover from it so then you mm -hmm. can go back in and keep adding on that volume and that progressive overload yeah i like that and you sort of touched on the, the team and the professional side of things. So I want to jump ahead to when we had uh, for a little bit later, but another common mistake is poor communication with your healthcare team. And as Rob mentioned there, there are thankfully a new wave of uh, practitioner, healthcare professional, physios, osteos, chiros, who have a really good understanding of training. Whereas I think historically, there was a bit of a division between trainers and therapists, except for in elite sport where you'd get people who understood both pretty well. Now, thankfully, it's filtering down to be more available to more people. And I'm lucky to work with a few exceptional therapists at the training stimulus who are, are 
very well qualified in treatment and training. And I think that's really the sweet spot in that if you work with somebody like that, if you're an athlete yourself, you like training, they get it. They understand what you're trying to do with your body. And they're not just trying to get your shoulder back to buttoning up your shirt yourself. They understand that shoulder needs to snatch a hundred kilos. They need to, that shoulder needs to hand somebody off when you're playing rugby. So those stepping stones and those gaps might extend beyond that level 10, as you said, rather than just getting you from naught to one. And I think <clears throat> if you have a coach, if you have a physio, chiro, osteo, then having them linked up to understand the full context of you as an individual and the things you want to be able to do with your body, that is invaluable in connecting the dots. The one recommendation I would have for this is almost have a dedicated team captain. So who's coordinating between them. Usually it would fall to your coach as they have the most oversight of your overall training and volume and the most work that you do with your body. But depending on your individual situation, like if you've just had surgery or something, then maybe it'll be a doctor. If you are quite heavily or quite early in the rehab process, then it might fall to your physio. So play it by ear, depending on your personal circumstances, but have that one person who is pulling the strings and connecting the dots, because you might have certain exercises from one person, others from another, some advice on rest and recovery from a third. So as an athlete, ideally outsource that to somebody um, who has that oversight, like I say, but definitely working on the communication with your healthcare team is a huge one when you're coming back from an injury. Yeah, and I think as well, if you're a trainer and you don't feel too comfortable heading up that, then let the physio take the lead and then you can be and then you can be talking to the physio to make sure that you understand what you're doing for your client is then the right thing to do because I think it's this is then where your ego can take over and it actually ends at the detriment of your client and it's it's massive it's like when i I know when so one of my clients who's going through a bit of an injury process at the moment and they're they're working alongside uh, they're working with franco so past show guest and he's pretty much one of the physios i always refer out to because again i know he understands what training is i know he understands at a high level training what it takes and what people want to push towards so and then whenever we've had any conversations about my client, we've always kind of worked together and discussed it together as in what would be best here. I've voiced some certain like exercises or approaches that I want to say go for my client and he will say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So then we can have that collaborative process. So then my client knows that when she comes to see me that we've had this discussion and we're both yeah. on the same page making sure we're doing the same things and yeah. that then and then all the exercises that he's prescribing her i've got videos of so i'm seeing and i'm getting an understanding of okay this is what franco wants from her for her to do so in the training side of things i'm going to do things that are going to complement those 100 percent. yeah i think that's the opposite of that is the nightmare where everyone's working in isolation and you get conflict of information and conflict of execution. So yeah, the worst case scenario is the physio is telling you one thing, the trainer is telling you another, and the athlete ends up confused and unsure what to do and gets almost paralyzed by that confusion because they feel like both things are wrong when in reality, excuse me, they could probably do either and still get some benefit. It's, yeah, it's invaluable to have the situation there with Franco where you both have an open dialogue and you can openly share the ideas and work together. And yeah, I've had similar interactions with him and other good physios where you're both singing from the same hymn sheet. The athlete gets a nice um, aligned view of their situation. Harmonious. They know what the priorities are. So again, harmonious, harmonious, exactly. And I think that's the ideal outcome because then you get synergies rather than conflict between the uh, the different people in the team. So that'll definitely be a big one to get right if you can. So I think this then leads us into the building the wrong kinds of strength because 
like if you have the right communications with the physio then mm. we'll probably bypass this one but if you don't or your physio whatever's happened and they're only recommend you to do certain things it means we can be preparing our bodies for something that's not actually what it needs to be doing and we yeah. stay at a certain level and what we see a lot of the time is things like using tempo work and isometric work to to help the area because it's a way to kind of slow things down to have control but if we're someone that goes running around on a pitch or does anything plyometric of any sorts, you can't stay in that tempo and isometric state because track your normal training is a, is a lot more explosive and your body, when we're talking about those stepping stones, that's such a big jump going from slow and holding to jumping plyometrically and like full blown sprinting. Yeah, exactly. So this links nicely to what we were saying before about bridging the gap sufficiently and i think if you work with professionals who have a good idea of that full training journey that we should be going along they'll know the relative importance and appropriate proportions of what types of training so we're not saying there's no place for tempos we're not saying there's no place for isometrics we're saying that depending on where you want to go with the training you probably don't want to be doing those only because not many people compete in sports where you only do tempos and you only do isometrics. And the same goes for isolating muscles. There may be a time and a place if you've identified a severe imbalance where you want to work on that weak area. But if you are a performance athlete where you care about your output, you still need to reintegrate that weak area into an overall movement pattern. So say, for example, you been doing some quad work because you identified your quads aren't doing enough exactly how you go about that we can discuss in more detail another time but however you do it what you definitely need to do is reintegrate using that quad in your squat or in your running pattern because there's no point having a now stronger quad if you can't actually access it in the movements that matter and this applies to all muscles, all movement patterns, all uh, movement qualities as well, in that developing them in isolation is all well and good, but it's only really useful if you can actually use them when it counts. So calf raises, doing them uh, slow and isometric is good at some point in the journey, but eventually you want those calves to be used fast and explosively, which is much more useful when playing sport so we we keep kind of alluding to a bit of a stepping stone i think it'd be a good place to kind of maybe give an example because it's like i i was thinking of a similar sort of thing of like a maybe like a tweaked adductor like on the inner thigh because i know that happens a lot when people especially when they're getting into running and normally it's because they've gone from zero to 100 very quickly but let's stick with your the the calf one so we've spoken about doing some isometrics doing some slow tempo work what's next to make sure that when we're going towards backing on backing onto a field sprinting what's going to be the next step next step after calf raises after calf raises like with so yeah so like we've gone through some tempo we've gone some like isolation um isometric work we've isolated the calf to some respect so we've been said right we're gonna because we've had a bit of a tweak calf so we're getting ourselves primed and prepped so now the body is at a state saying okay this calf now feels better Mm -hmm. But that's the slow standing still. How do we now get back to our sprinting speed? And what? how many stepping... Obviously, the stepping stones are going to be very individual and how many is going to be needed. But as a broad brush, yeah. how many steps would we roughly be looking at? I wouldn't, I wouldn't commit to a number of steps because no, it's very individual but, for whoever is... But the stage is more like the stage. Yeah, yeah so, but the way I would break it down is more by movement qualities yeah. so in terms of speed load ground reaction force and also direction so if they are a straight line sprinter versus a field sport player the multi-directional component is going to play a, a larger port for, mm. a larger part for that field sport player and i would definitely push people towards matt mckinnis watson again because i love the way he categorizes plyometrics so yeah. once you've got a prerequisite amount of isometric and slow strength 
through the foot and calf complex, I'd be looking to move that higher up that spectrum of specificity that we always talk about towards whatever you want to do. So is it speed? Is it um, yeah ground reaction forces? Is it change of direction? So simple bridging steps. I think he would always start with more extensive plyometrics, which are sort of low amplitude, low load, just building up volume and ground contacts to build that basic low level tissue tolerance. So the body's learning to sequence as well between the foot, ankle, calf, knee, hips, even upstream of the body. How can you deal with those forces and dissipate them appropriately and, bru and build the appropriate amount of stiffness and relaxation at the right times, which I think is super important. Then it is a little bit more free flowing depending on the person in front of you and what they, they lack the most. Maybe you'll wanna to go to multi-directional stuff then before you start going to heavier landings, higher jumps, longer jumps, higher speed. So you've got options in terms of which movement qualities you dial up when, depending on somebody's priorities and where they want to go. But I think as a principle, knowing that those different categories exist and that they should all be progressed up the spectrum of specificity towards where you want to go, you can almost identify your gaps through that lens. So am I ready for this amplitude of um, jump? Am I ready for this speed of jump? Am I ready for these changes of direction? And as long as you're progressing each of those areas steadily, you're going to end up with a far better result than just thinking, I'm done with extensive pliers. I'm done with hops, you know, and I'm ready on to the next thing. Actually touching on each of those movement qualities readily, regularly, is going to put you in a really good position and have actually tons of uh, carryover benefits kind of full stop and you you'll feel very ready to return to sport if you've gone about things like that versus i think the classic print out pdf of yeah. do your calf raises and then you're good to go yeah and i think what's really important there as well is understanding what I, what you said about where you want to get back to so your your return to sport and the demands that that's need that's needed to get you back there because like if you look at um mckenzie watson's uh a lot of the posts and stuff that he does and like you see some of his high plyometrics like big jumps and big bounds like maybe you don't need to be that far up that that's not where you need to be right this moment and like you and even you to return to sport does don't necessarily need to be able to do that either Absolutely. but you might think okay cool that might be a really good thing to expose myself to at some point because i don't want this un untrained position to suddenly knock me out when and then when i was feeling in good state again so i don't want to be injured again so maybe what holes in my training or overall in my like my say development are missing and yeah. so and i know when it does come to injury like that that plyometric say continuum of bringing ourselves back to a form of full full um full capabilities is it's been really massive just seeing it and getting a deeper understanding and i'm still i've still got loads to learn but it's it's been fascinating to kind of know more about it and expose myself to certain things because it really has played a big benefits and as I've, I've started to get into running myself again a bit more mm. recently and like doing some of my warm-ups now i'm actually warming up for it i'm not just I'm not going out and just starting to run straight away so it's, it's been quite fun yeah exactly i think that mindset will benefit a lot of people in in thinking of the multi-dimensional qualities that an exercise can have not just multi-directional and not multi-dimensional in terms of multi-directional but in terms of speed in terms of like ground reaction forces um there's so uh, reactivity as well so adding in almost like an element of randomness and unpredictability which for field sports i think is huge but in the gym we never really get exposed to because uh there's a nice phrase i like the speed of sport you need to practice at the speed of sport so it's all well and good being able to do really nice controlled uh, hopping drills but that foot and ankle if you're rehabilitating an ankle or calf might need to change direction at a much greater speed if you're playing rugby and somebody tries to sidestep you for example so if you haven't given it that sort of exposure in training 
the chances of it holding up under the speed of sport are less. So can you progressively build towards that with low level reactivity drills? And this is why you see a lot of um, trendy trainers online doing fun drills with tennis balls where somebody has to like run and grab it or catch it over here, catch it over there, because you're trying to bypass that conscious side of the movement and just get the tissues reacting at the speed of sport. And when we come at things from a pure gym, from a pure strength and conditioning point of view, sometimes that's the gap that we leave that we don't uh, think to plug and we think isn't part of that rehab journey when actually you could argue it's almost the most important part to really get ready to return to sport. Well, I think we've touched on it before when we spoke about having play in your training because mm -hmm. play is then you're, it's, it's, you know, it's, you're moving without thought. So you're, you're just doing and like as you say like with the tennis balls and stuff like that you're seeing that i'm seeing that quite a lot on insta as well so we're probably getting targeted by the same type of people but it's um i think it's fun i think it really is and i think it's it's, it's cool yeah. that like this side of things is starting to be exposed more as a way of doing things because i think the print out pdf style of rehabbing essentially is starting to be dated don't get me wrong there's still going to be plenty of people get in their cells because they don't train they're the people that need just the pdf just to get them back to be able to do yeah. up their shirt as you said but the people that train i think they're realizing there is more to the more to rehab than the pdf so and this is where exactly. i think like the points that we're discussing here become really um at the forefront of their mind because they're like fuck like I am more than a PDF. And like, yes, you are more than a PDF. So, um, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think this leads into one of our next points because I kind of wanted to shuffle the order slightly only because I think pain medication masking reality is, I think there is a time for things like ibuprofen and stuff like that to kind of like help with inflammation. Maybe you've just had an injury or something like that and you just, you need some relief. But mm -hmm. where I see this going wrong is where people then rely upon it to train yeah. Yeah. and for me it's like i'm like me and hannah like my wife two opposites where well it's, to be fair she's not like i need some like paracetamol or anything like that but i'm like so anti-paracetamol and ibuprofen every night i'm just like if i've got a headache i'm just gonna deal with it like I, I, and hannah's like oh i'll take a paracetamol to help me to mm -hmm. alleviate it fine she's got to deal with a crying baby and stuff like that I'm like, like whatever like fine Whereas for me, I've just always been of the mindset of just like if I if I've got something going on and I want to take something for it, I need should address the problem. And this kind of goes back to the first point with the symptoms, not causes, right? Because it's like if I've got a headache, why have I got a headache? I don't just randomly get a headache. There's a reason why you've got a headache, and I think that's for me a more interesting point. And now bringing it back into what we're talking about here is when you're having say when you're taking any like paracetamol or, or ibuprofen or that kind of stuff to mask say a back pain an elbow pain or whatever or rubbing like ibuprofen gel on your elbow just so you can bench press or press overhead like that's not right like yeah. don't get me wrong if you're about to run onto a rugby pitch and you're like mid-season and you're you do what you got to do you're getting through it's just part of it but if that's not part of your day-to-day -day training and you're doing it just to get through training you need to have a bit of a step back and understand what's going on. Yeah. So, yeah, this is a common rehab mistake in that you're hiding from reality. So pain exists for a reason. Like we've evolved pain to protect us. And don't get me wrong, it's a complex subject and has a lot of nuances. And that's one of the episodes we do with Franco, which is worth scrolling back through the archives for when we talk about pain. Um, but my stance on it is that overall it serves to help us so it's giving us some useful information about the current state of our body it does like i say it does hang over beyond a useful point in many situations where painkillers can be tremendously helpful but they should be as far as possible short-term strategies rather than long-term strategies there are exceptions to that but by and large, the mistake that I see in terms of rehab is relying on painkillers and pain medication to do what you want to do extended over a long period of time 
you're clearly not dealing with the underlying cause, as Rob said there, which means you could be actually doing further damage because you're hiding from the reality of the situation. So if you've got something wrong with your mechanics, something's wearing away, you're just using painkillers to get through sessions and it's not getting better over time, then you might actually be wearing away at some tissues and doing further damage. Short term, that might be a cost you're willing to pay. If you've got a competition or you're peaking for something, then you can make that trade off personally. But over a long period of time, I would not recommend it for anybody but the absolute elite where it's their livelihood and they absolutely have to make a living from it. There's all sorts of side effects from a lot of these medications where your health will suffer otherwise. Like, it's, like ibuprofen in particular is terrible for your guts if you take it for consistent amounts of time. So short term, it might feel like it's worth it. But I think long term, there's a lot of costs to pay, which um, if they can be avoided, should be avoided. Mm. Big caveat, we are not doctors. So yeah. speak to your doctor if you have any concerns about your um, medication. But just from a coaching perspective, seeing people banging ibuprofen before every session is just not something I would ever endorse. No, and I think as well, it also reminds me of like, like I'm, I, I understand the need for things like antibiotics and stuff like that, but like it's the exact reason why it's only a course and you're supposed to only do it for a period of time and then you're supposed to, you're supposed to take probiotics afterwards to help kind of rebuild your gut because of how much it trashes you. And the reason they give you a course or something is because it's normally enough to help dissipate whatever the issue is that they're that's that you're taking the antibiotics for now when you're just taking say ibuprofen and you're you're as just as said there you know trashing your guts and stuff like that and not helping your insides and masking this problem it doesn't give you an indication of what's actually what's needed and this kind of leads us into our last point which is like what by taking these pain medications means we're not going to have enough rest. We're not going to recover well enough. Our nutrition might then end up taking a hit because, you know, maybe our appetite gets suppressed. I know that's happened to people that I know have taken quite a high level, like pain medications, like their appetite goes to shit. They don't drink enough. So their hydration levels mm -hmm. are all over the place, which all of those like rest, recovery, nutrition, and hydration are key in the recovery process. And if you're yeah. not giving your body the opportunity to recover properly because you're masking it with pain medication, you're just you're asking for this to not only drag out for longer than necessary, but also give you potentially a worse situation to be dealing with later down the line because you've been masking it for so long. Exactly right. Yeah, I think if you have tissue damage from an injury, you need to do everything you can to stimulate the healing process and yeah rob's just said it there rest recovery hydration and nutrition are the fundamentals so if you're taking medication which disrupts any of those so if it impairs your ability to sleep if you're taking lots of caffeine or stimulants to train if you're disrupting your gut because you're taking tons of ibuprofen you're not going to be digesting or absorbing the food that you eat as well and if you're not taking care of your hydration, you're not giving your body the raw materials it needs to regenerate the tissues that have been damaged. So you are kicking the can down the road. You're not um, actually positioning yourself to get back to training as quickly as possible. And I think I understand why it happens in that when people are injured, they often lose motivation because they're not training like they used to or like they want to. So they can kind of fall off the bandwagon and think, have a bit of a fuck it mentality. But actually, if there's ever a time to double down on these things, it's when you're injured because you can get out of the injured state sooner by getting really on top of all of these things. So redivert that energy to being thinking about these as opportunities. They're almost training opportunities, even though they're outside of the gym. Mm. You can win in other ways by nailing your rest by nailing your nutrition and hydration there are other things rather than hitting your percentages in your session for example you can tick these boxes and know that you're taking active steps towards your recovery and get back to 
full training as soon as you can stepping out my wheelhouse like that and i'm not doing any recommendations or any anything here i'm just it's just made me think of depression and you know when they say about how when people are depressed the one thing that helps them is to get active again and like to yep. move and get outside and stuff like that but when you're depressed it's the last thing you want to do and it's that thing of the more you stay in that depressed state the further down you go and the harder it is to get active again get yourself out of that depression and it just reminded me exactly when you're saying there with like when you're injured it does feel counterintuitive you're like oh I, sh I don't care about my recovery now or my nutrition because yeah. i'm not doing anything and it's like no but your body is in overdrive right now your body is trying to get you back to homeostasis of what and mm -hmm. homeostasis for you is going to be a lot higher than the average person because you train so it's trying to get you right back to where you was so if you're not supporting yeah. it and i and this is coming from personal like i know I've, I've, uh, if I've had an injury spell or anything like that, I might have a couple of extra beers, a couple of extra pizzas, you know, like that, because I'm just, I feel sorry for myself. <laughs> and you're like, is, uh, it's just, it's that. But the thing is, feeling sorry for yourself is normal. You then need to sort your shit out, and get back into it, and understand that, okay, you can have that feel sorry for yourself, but don't let it last too long, because otherwise, then, yeah. just like with the depression, you can get further and further away. And then you're just making another situation we deal with that you've got to deal with. A load of extra inflammation in your body from the alcohol. You've got to deal with it from the shitty food. Now you've got extra body fat on you because you've eaten shit. So like all these sort of yeah. things, you're actually making it worse for you. And it's like, it's this is where when you are injured and you are trying to bring yourself back, having that, as we've spoken to earlier, like having those team of people around you. And if you don't mm -hmm. have any professionals that you can kind of talk to, talk to Ash and myself, you know, talk talk to someone, talk to say maybe someone else in your gym, maybe your training buddy or something like that. Just try and talk to someone where you can kind of voice your thoughts or listen to this podcast, take note of these six points and say, right, okay, what, where am I in this journey? What have I got to do to now get myself back to homeostasis? Homeostasis and yeah. where can I, how can I then get better? Because that's really, yeah. we, we don't want to just get back to where we was. We want to be able to get there and carry on progressing and going further than we was. And that is yeah. very possible. Exactly. And I think the the mis one of the key mistakes in mindset here is thinking because you're not training as hard as you possibly can, it means that you don't need to, your body's not working hard or you don't need to fuel your body. And if anyone wears a whoop or a, a Fitbit type thing, I remember when I was wearing mine once and I got food poisoning, a couple of times whilst I had food poisoning, it recognized workouts because my heart rate went so high that it thought it was actually a training session. And that just goes to show you when you're sick or injured, your body has extra work to do to get you back to baseline. And it's very apparent physiologically that that's going on. So the idea that the inputs from a nutrition or hydration point of view are not important is, is nonsense. So, the mistakes happen in both ways. People eat tons of shit, overeat, but undernourish, I would say, by going the junk food route. But equally, people make the other mistake in that they malnourish themselves by thinking, oh, I'm not training. I can't justify the calories. You definitely, well, not definitely, you might not need as many calories, but you definitely should focus on the quality of nu your nutrition because you need all those micronutrients that are the fundamental building blocks of regenerating quality mm. tissue well I, again out of the wheelhouse but i i would definitely say you'd need to be in at least maintenance you wouldn't want to be in a deficit when you're trying to recover because at the end of the day it's mm. it's essentially like you're trying to build muscle because that's essentially what you're yeah. trying to so really should be in a surplus so don't know don't this is where okay understanding how much of a surplus you need to be in is going to be not not for me to tell you but you do need to understand and like think about what the body is actually trying to do like i mentioned earlier and that's what i said there it's trying to do a massive task because essentially all it normally has to do is repair the muscle that you're breaking down right but now it's got to repair the muscle and beyond because you fucked it so it's not <laughs> so it's not got these little tears it's got this fucking massive crater that it's got to repair so it now <laughs> needs more to so give it more so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so yeah. right so i think uh, this is a nice time to um kind of wrap this up because i think we've, we've touched on those six points so just to reiterate them making sure that we're understanding you're treating symptoms not causes um it's a very very easy one to do especially 
when you've got, I say, a bad back, bad elbow, sore knee, normally it's that point where it isn't the actual issue. And it can be easy just to give you that short-term gratification of, oh, I'm feeling better now. But long-term, you're probably not doing yourself any favors. And then making sure, point number two, is not bridging the gap sufficiently. So making sure you've got those stepping stones, make sure you can get back to your sport that you're playing, whether that's just in the gym or whether it's out in the field or rolling around on a mat, making sure that your body is in a state that's you've taken the appropriate steps to get there so it's not such a shock to the system. Um, make sure you've got good communication. Point, point number three, make sure you've got good communication with your healthcare team, whether that's your physio, your PT, whoever. Everyone's talking to each other and making sure that you're all singing off the same hymn sheet. And if they're not, under, make sure they understand why they're not and actually understand that they become singing off the same hymn sheet because that is important so you don't get confused then understanding building the wrong kinds of strength can be be an issue because if you stay focusing on this slow steady work and that's not your style of training again kind of bridging that gap talk um, stepping stones we want to make sure that we have the sufficient journey of back to getting that plyometric state that explosive nature especially if you are um, do any sort of running or anything like that and then obviously pain medication make sure that it's not covering up something that's actually making it worse and that down the line you're going to be ending up wishing that you actually dealt with it earlier on and when you're fucked don't just eat pizza and drink beer like me get yourself enough rest eat yourself um, (laughs) eat yourself recovery get yourself recovered Um, nourish yourself and hydrate yourself because the quicker you can get yourself recovered because you're providing yourself with those nutrients, the better it's going to be for you in the long run because you're going to have all the necessary building blocks to come back stronger, fitter, faster. I can't think any more Fs, but fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so um, as always, guys, uh, you know, we really appreciate you each and every single week. Uh, we, we get a lot of um, tags. Sometimes we share them. Most of the time we try and share them on our Instagram. But thank you very much for tagging them and spreading the episodes, especially the old episodes. We love seeing it when the archives come out and people are going back through our old episodes. You know, even if you just want a bit of uh, some comedy value, go back to the YouTube and, you know, <laughs> go, go back to some of our early episodes. And yeah, yeah they're, they're great. But as always, you know, thank you for tuning in each and every every, each and every week um as always if you want to support the podcast you can head over to wit fitness uh for all your wit kit and use discount code ll15 to get yourself 15 percent off any purchase and also you can head over to hydro for your blood flow uh, blood flow restriction apparel and use code ll20 for 20 percent off so thank you we'll see you next week Cheers, guys.